Amateur radio as a hobby seems to appeal less and less to younger people in this modern age of social media, smartphones and the internet. But many decades ago, radio did have a large appeal to the younger audience. Boy Scout groups were active on the radio during the 1920s, and during the 1950s, 60s, 70s and 80s, many schools, colleges and universities had their own special radio clubs, complete with club calls, shacks and lots more. This is the story of the Umist Radio Society, one of the many radio clubs at the universities in Manchester, which received its licence back in 1957. Despite being active for many decades, there's very little information about the club, but I've traced the history of one of the largest of Manchester's forgotten university radio societies. For clarity, UMIS stands for the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. It was also known as the Manchester College of Science and Technology and later became the University of Manchester. I covered this subject back in 2019 and showed you this, the original Club Shack, whose history we'll cover in this video and we'll also be taking a trip back to the shack in 2022 to see how things have changed. All of these radio clubs are long since defunct and there isn't much, if any, information about them on the internet, but one Club Shack is still in existence, albeit forgotten and sealed away. Using limited sources, I've managed to piece together the story of these university amateur radio societies, which had quite a long and interesting life. Due to the amount of time that's passed, there's very little evidence remaining online that these clubs ever existed at all, and whilst there's more information about the UMIS club than others, such as the Victoria University of Manchester club, I'll tell the story as best I can. The story of You Missed and the Lost Radio Shack falls into three main chapters, the first being its set up and operation from the old biochemistry building under D. Gordon Bagg, who held the call sign VP4TO from Trinidad years earlier. The second chapter relates to operation from the Sackville Street building under Duncan Wheelhouse, and the third is the final years unrelated to the university, but still on the premises. I'm going to show you lots of artefacts from the club's life, so feel free to pause if you wish to read them in detail. The Umist Amateur Radio Club could be traced back to 1957, when an amateur radio sound licence was issued to G4TO of what was the Manchester College of Science and Technology, and more specifically, the Faculty of Technology. The licence allowed transmissions from its first club shack, located on the top of the university's biochemistry building in room J18X. Before this, a radio station on the premises was used to train pilots during the Second World War. Despite this, records show that the club callsign G3CXX was first issued in 1947, but was cancelled in 1952. This was then reissued to the club upon request in 1958. The first club constitution was established in early 1958, and a small but growing number of enthusiastic students showed interest in amateur radio and joined up. They started to gather equipment from late 1957 and wrote to numerous suppliers such as Panda Radio in Rochdale, and on October 28, 1957, a grant of £59 was authorised by the university to buy a Panda Cub transmitter. This is the original memo to the principal from Gordon Bagg, dated the 28th of October 1957, where he asks for permission to install a radio transmitter at the college. Two days later came a reply from the principal giving permission to search out some sort of second-hand ex-military transmitter like those listed in Wireless World. By February of 1958, the principal was pleased with the progress made by the club and there was a homebrew transmitter in the shack which operated on 20 meters and 40 meters, as well as another transmitter presented by Marconi's Wireless Telegraph Company Limited. By mid-1958, three students belonged to the Radio Society, G3JAG, G3LZW and G3LHD. However, many students were showing interest in the group at the time and their names were sent to the GPO for authorisation to use the shack equipment. Students couldn't use the shack equipment without them being on the list of authorised users held by the GPO. 
There was a complaint on this during January of 1969 in which a letter was sent to the university by Alwyn D. Camp, G3NYR, who observed this misuse of the club shack. The letter was about licensed stations but they weren't licensed to use the club shack. The letter reached Gordon Bagg and he educated the students on the correct operating procedure and tightened the rules on unauthorised people entering the shack and using its equipment. Every time new students joined the club, a list of names had to be sent off to the GPO and they in turn were granted permission to use the shack and the club call. On the roof of this building was a 60 foot Versa tower which housed antennas such as a tri-band quad, a G5 RV and a 160 metre wire which was put up between this building and an even taller building to the east. The Umis club was still extremely active during the 1950s, 1960s and into the 1970s and 80s after the shack relocated to the Sackville Street building. This move came about due to the shack sharing its original space with cages that were used to house animals for testing. By 1961 there was a large number of licensed amateurs who had joined the club including two girls who were studying to become nuns. They wanted to join the society with a view to obtaining their licenses so they could transmit when they went on mission. However, by 1963, activity at the club had dwindled, leading to a recruitment drive involving notices being put up around the university to attract new members. The transmitter station was rebuilt after this short period of inactivity and once again became active. The club used various call signs over the years, and whilst the call signs G3CXX and G6CXX are now long since defunct, GAFOT is still registered to the Manchester University Institute of Science and Technology to this day. G3CXX and G6CXX were issued to D. Gordon Bagg, G4TO, and reassigned later to Dr. Geoffrey F. Gott in 1973. A check of the 1992 RSGB call book shows that these call signs were still active, or at least still assigned during the 1990s. GAFOT, which stood for Faculty of Technology, was also used for a while as well, but this lapsed in 1981. Students of the shack entered many contests, and in the first top band contest of 1967, they scored 500 points, putting them in 14th place, out of 47 contacts. Between September the 8th and October the 5th 1969, the Umist Amateur Radio Society used the special event call sign GB3MAN to operate during Freshers' Week from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. The contest ran on all bands, 10 metres to 160 metres running AM, CW, SSB and RITI. The operator of GB3MAN was G3YMM, who was the club secretary at this time. November the 7th and 8th 1970 marked the annual Top Band Shortwave Magazine Club Contest and the UMIS team entered. The magazine reported however the disqualification of G3CXX saying the following. Having said all this, we now have to come to the nasty bit, disqualification. This time the unlucky ones are Manchester University Institute of Science and Technology, G3CXX. The trouble once again was the clicks, probably the same subtle reason for the same noises emanating from the same type of rig as was penalised last year. If G3CXX had looked at the back of the key jack, they would have probably found the 4.7 microfarad click suppressing capacitor making only intermittent contact, due to the flexing of the spring leaf when the plug is put in or out. However, possibly remembering last year, G3CXX was told about the clicks a couple of days before MCC. Several stations made the required addition to the RST code during their QSOs, and lots of people complained. Sad indeed, as if they had been radiating acceptable signals, they would have won by a clear margin of 500 points, However, there it is, and let us hope that all the stations entering next year are inside the rules. The club entered and won the 1971 contest with 6,981 points, and noted 26 non-club station QSOs during the event too, which proved how busy the contests were back then. 
Consistently strong signals were suspect, however contestants made a declaration to follow the rules, and the invigilators felt comfortable to accept G3CXX's strong signal, observing that this was down to their choice of two large antennas. One being a half wave 150 foot wire above ground and a 300 semi vertical with the far end 250 feet off the ground. Both were located on the Sackville Street building. Their transmitter for the contest was a Kodar AT5. Nevertheless, at the contest monitoring station in North Buckinghamshire, there were times when both GM3 TKV portable at 98 feet above ground and EI9 ONE using a half wave over a reservoir were even stronger than G3CXX. During the 1974 contest, UMIS Amateur Radio Society named themselves the Technical Institute Transmitting Society for the occasion. I'm sure you can work out the acronym for yourself. The name change was a protest against shortwave magazine, with Birmingham University changing their name to BUMS. They declared 310,000 points for this contest due to a mathematical error, however they in fact scored 28,160, putting them first. The radio of choice for this contest was a throttled back KW Electronics KW2000A with an amplifier in a 19 inch rack, and again the choice of two aerials. Contest organisers remarked that G3CXX was well operated by G3YRU and G3ZSS. I can't pinpoint the exact date, but at some point during the late 1970s, the original shack moved to the Sackville Street building that belonged to UMIST and it stayed here permanently. D. Gordon Bagg retired from the university many years earlier, but stayed on to run the club until around 1972. I'm unsure on the circumstances surrounding him leaving the club and it appears that it was inactive for a time from 1972 until 1980 with licence renewal fees not being paid. The new club secretary set out on a mission to find out information regarding the club and its call signs and in 1980 a request was sent for information on the call signs registered to the university. In 1981, the call signs G3CXX and G6CXX were re-established for use by the UMIST Radio Society. So that's the first chapter on the UMIST Radio Society. Join me in the next episode as we look at a more modern society as it returns with a new secretary, many more members, its network of pirate repeaters and as we enter the shack for the final time before it disappears forever.